The 4th of July, 1954, America stood proud that Independence Day. The parades were high-stepping and high-spirited. The economy was booming, the weather was good, and the country was on vacation. The last echoes of the Second World War were silenced when the French agreed to pull out of Indochina, leaving behind the two countries, North and South Vietnam. Nobody knew then that they would pull the United States into another war. At home, the witch hunts which had gripped the nation during Senator McCarthy's exploitation of the Red Menace were being exposed as hysterical and unconstitutional. President Dwight Eisenhower and Prime Minister Winston Churchill signed the Potomac Agreement to cement Anglo-American unity in Washington. As usual on Independence Day, there were speedboats on Lake Erie and picnickers on its shores. But for one lakeside community, the holiday brought shock and confusion. At six o'clock on that holiday morning, the police had been called by the mayor of Bay Village. His neighbor, Marilyn Shepard, had been attacked, knifed, and brutally slaughtered. In Cleveland, 13 miles away, it was a quiet day for news, and the papers there reacted quickly. Reporters and cameramen hurried to the gracious home of the respected neurosurgeon, Dr. Samuel Shepard, one of the leading citizens in a close-knit community. It was his wife, Marilyn, who had been brutally stabbed and left to die, apparently by an intruder. Neighbors Esther and Spencer Hook had been the first people the doctor had phoned when he found the body at 5.45 a.m. His home had been ransacked, perhaps in a search for drugs. His medical bag had been upended, and Dr. Sam said he had been twice knocked out. Upstairs lay the battered, punctured body of Marilyn Shepard. Her pajama top had been rolled up, and she had suffered 35 separate wounds, most on her face and head, some on her neck and hands. Her husband's story was that he had fallen asleep on the living room couch and had awoken to hear Marilyn screaming. He had rushed upstairs and seen someone dressed in white near his wife's bed. Then he was hit from behind. When he came to, he found his wife was dead. He checked that their child was safe and then ran downstairs to tackle one of the intruders on the lake shore. His next memory was of coming to on the beach with his feet in the water. Married for nine years, Marilyn and Sam Shepard had been childhood sweethearts. They had one child, a son aged seven, and Marilyn was expecting a second in the autumn. His dominant father had insisted that he came back to Ohio from California and worked with his two brothers at the highly successful osteopathic hospital which Dr. Shepard Sr. had started in 1948. Sam Shepard was in charge of surgery. At first, everyone was sympathetic towards the injured doctor, but soon there were rumors that he had been secretly dating a member of the hospital staff. Detectives Robert Schottke and Patrick Barrow suspected that all was not as it seemed. In what became an hysterical press crusade, the Cleveland papers decided that Dr. Sam was guilty of killing his wife and campaigned for his arrest. At the inquest, coroner Samuel Gerber expelled Shepard's lawyer and spent eight hours grilling the doctor. The press got its way on the 30th of July. A mob cheered as they led the young doctor into custody. His trial at Cuyahoga County Courthouse 
was described by an appeal court as a carnival. Before it even started, it was widely reported that the authorities considered that Sam Shepard was guilty as hell. Dr. Samuel Gerber, the coroner, made much of bloodstains found on the defendant's wristwatch, and the fact that in the morning Sam Shepard was no longer wearing the white T-shirt he had had on the night before. This surprisingly unbloody one was found on the beach. Gerber also announced that marks on the blood-stained pillow could only have been made with a surgical instrument. Dr. Shepard was, of course, a surgeon. The defense failed to ask him what sort of instrument would have made this particular shape. Throughout, the defense was poorly marshaled. Not produced in court was this fragment of a tooth found in the bedroom, which fitted none of either Sam or Marilyn's teeth. Nor was this scrap of red leather, which didn't match anything owned by anyone in the Shepard household. Nor was the jury shown these scrapings from under Marilyn's nails, which matched nothing in the house. A motive was provided by the prosecution when their mystery woman was revealed as the doctor's lover, laboratory technician Susan Hayes. She testified that he had talked of marriage and getting a divorce from Marilyn, but was afraid of his father's wrath. The jury was unimpressed when Dr. Sam admitted lying about his affair at the inquest, pleading that was to protect Susan Hayes, not himself. He claimed to have been driven to another woman by Marilyn's fear of sex after the difficult birth of their son. The jury, unsequestered throughout the trial, and thus able to read the prejudiced newspaper reporting, began deliberating at 9 a.m. on the 17th of December. It was four and a half days before they delivered their verdict. Guilty of murder in the second, unpremeditated degree. The sentence, life imprisonment. The once popular, once successful young doctor couldn't believe what was happening to him. As the journey to jail and degradation began, he vowed to fight on. All through his arrest and trial, the authorities had kept his house locked up. Only now were the keys handed back so that private investigators could look inside and discover any evidence that might be used to fight the jury's verdict. His lawyers instituted a search for a man with bushy hair, which was the fleeting impression he had of the person he chased on the beach. Two witnesses came forward to say they saw such a man with bushy hair near the house, but their evidence wasn't considered convincing enough, and back to jail he went. Amid fears for his mental stability, he received some terrible news. Although his mother had remained steadfast in believing his innocence of murder, she was shattered by the revelations of his infidelity. She took her husband's gun and shot herself. Eleven days later, his grieving father died of a gastric ulcer. Now that he could get into the house, Dr. Sam's lawyer hired a scientific criminologist, Dr. Paul Leland Kirk, to study the scene of the crime. Among his discoveries were that the killer was left-handed, Shepard was not and that a large spot of blood on the closet door was neither Marilyn's nor her husband's. With this evidence from the scene of the crime, his lawyer tried to get a new trial, but was turned down. All the courts rejected the argument that the tooth showed that someone else was there, and that the amount of blood on the pillow must mean that the murderer would have been covered with more blood than had been on Dr. Sam. Hope flickered when a convict in Florida confessed to the murder. He said he was under the influence of heroin. After a visit from Corinna Gerber, he recanted. The creator of Perry Mason, Earl Stanley Gardner, became involved when his court of last resort, an independent investigating operation sponsored by a mystery magazine, looked into the case. It took polygraph tests of the Shepherd brothers and was ready to put Dr. Sam himself on the lie detector machine when the state refused permission.
a frustrated gardener had to withdraw his investigators. Enter a real-life Perry Mason. A 29-year-old Boston lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, took over the case in November 1961 and immediately applied his flamboyant talents. Shortly before this, Shepard had begun a correspondence romance with a dazzling German lady named Ariane Tebenjohans, who had become obsessed about the reports of his case in German magazines. When Ariane turned up in Ohio, she put the Shepard case back into the headlines. But the publicity threatened to blow up in his face when it was revealed that Ariane was not only a past member of the Hitler Youth, but that one of Hitler's leading henchmen, Joseph Goebbels, had been her brother-in-law. Her half-sister Magda had married him with Hitler as best man. Convinced that the circumstances surrounding the trial had violated Shepard's constitutional rights, F. Lee Bailey applied to the federal courts for a writ of habeas corpus. Dr. Sam Shepard, be seated. Uh, Dr. Shepard, uh, for the record, is a practicing physician. As Shepard later told a Senate committee, this led to new pressure from the state authorities. I was told that I should discharge Mr. F. Lee Bailey, my attorney. I should get Stephen Shepard and Richard Shepard off of the backs of the Ohio officials and uh, the uh, Ariane Tevenyans at the time off of their backs. I was uh, awakened approximately at 3.45 or 4 a.m., chained, handcuffed wrists, handcuffed, uh, well, leg cuffed, and chains between the legs and so forth around the neck. I was transported back to the Ohio Penitentiary and placed between two doors approximately 18 inches apart where I uh, stood for six days and nights. And when I was uh, taken out, this was without food or water. As a result, Shepard was refused parole. But on the 18th of July, 1964, he was freed on $10,000 bail after the federal judge hearing the plea of habeas corpus ruled that his constitutional rights had been severely infringed and ordered his release pending a retrial. The judge found five separate violations, branding the trial as a mockery of justice. Having spent one quarter of his 40-year life in jail, he was out. Two days later, he married Ariane Tebenjohans. For the media, the glamour of his romance was more interesting than the preparation for the final appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. You're in love with a man who's in prison. Um, well, that's why I came to the States, to find out if I really was in love, on, because there, you couldn't through. tell by somebody you have never met. I don't and uh, how many meetings did it take before you did decide? Uh, it was the first moment I walked into the visiting room. But Sam Shepard was far from being out of the woods, and F. Lee Bailey had no illusions. Mr. Bailey, how can a man be in jail 10 years and uh, just now be proven innocent or be released from jail? Because our system has some serious flaws in it. How do you explain his conviction in the first place? Uh, it was a result, according to Judge Weinman, and in my opinion, of mass hysteria generated by an overzealous press. Defiantly, Sam Shepard and his new wife bought a lakeside house less than a mile from his previous home. Then suddenly, the appeal court ordered him back to jail, unless the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case within 20 days. Again, Shepard's lawyer was strong in his defense. A few moments ago, an attorney from Cincinnati, Ohio, read to me portions of the opinion of the Sixth Circuit Court, which has ordered that Sam Shepard be returned to prison and has ordered that his release last July was improper. Uh, there was a very vigorous dissent in that opinion, so we now have four judges passing on the case in the federal courts, two very strongly for Sam, one against him. In any event, he's not going back to prison. We will file new appeals and I anticipate that at a very minimum he'll be out until the end of the year until we can finally resolve this very difficult case. On the 28th of February, 1966, crowds gathered for the crucial test before the Supreme Court of the United States. Over 10 years had passed uh, since the disputed trial. I think we are free to talk about the sufficiency of the evidence and that has been mentioned in the briefs, but 
Whether or not he is guilty is something that this form of action is not designed to test. Does he make any proclamation on that point at this date? Well, I think Sam has consistently said since the day he, the day his wife was killed that he didn't know anything about it and had nothing to do with it. The Attorney General of Ohio, William Saxby, arrived to argue that the original trial was fair. They never came up with any evidence that was worthy of being considered or reconsidered. Uh, they've built up a fiction over the years that uh, somehow this was not a fair trial or that they had evidence of uh, somebody else. Uh, he uh, published an article which he received pay for. I know that my wife's killer and uh, came up with absolutely nothing. And so uh, this is a fiction. That's all it is. It's built up over the years. But uh, like the uh, Sacco Vanzetti idea, uh, that there was something basically wrong, that this was prejudice that couldn't be overcome. They've tried to sell this idea over the years. Sam Shepard had a fair trial. He had a good jury. He had a good judge. It was properly conducted. The jury found him guilty. And uh, I think this court will assert that again. John T. Corrigan, prosecutor of Cuyahoga County, confirmed that no new evidence was being produced before the Supreme Court. Uh, Dr. Shepard, is he arguing that point? No. No, he uh, is not claiming now that there is any new evidence, whatever. The uh, record is as it stands, as it was presented to the jury some uh, almost 11 years ago now. Then he is not arguing guilt or innocence. He is uh, arguing strictly the pretrial publicity and the fairness of these uh, hearings. That's right. The contention is that he was denied a... Uh, fair trial because of the effect of the uh, pretrial publicity and the publicity during the course of the trial. Well, would this not then be a direct challenge to the jury system or the integrity of the jury? This, I think, certainly is the big issue in the case. The uh, question of whether or not uh, the jury system shall prevail and the further question of uh, the question of freedom of press. Despite the confidence of the Ohio authorities, the Supreme Court voted eight to one that the trial had been unfair. It ordered an immediate retrial or the dropping of the charges. So, at the same courthouse as before, Dr. Sam found himself on trial again. But this time, it would be a fair trial, promised the Ohio authorities. In order to conduct this trial, I deem it's necessary that there be no cameras or sound equipment of any sort on the second floor of the courthouse, nor the third floor of the courthouse. So there will be no misunderstanding. On the 4th of October, 1966, John Corrigan arrived at the courthouse to prosecute in front of Judge Francis Tolte. This time, his witnesses faced a tough cross-examination. Detective Schottke had to admit that he hadn't inquired whether it was feasible that Dr. Sam could have inflicted his injuries on himself, even though this could have been critical in assessing whether he was the murderer. The jury was taken to the house to see the scene for themselves. This enabled them to appreciate that Sam Shepard's story of not hearing his wife's cries at first was plausible, given his distance from her bedroom. and they were shown where the fragment of tooth was found that didn't belong either to Sam or Marilyn, and a scrap of red leather. As for the blood on the watch, Bailey revealed that there were specks on the inside of the strap as well as the outside, probably splashed on it later. But he saved his greatest scorn for Coroner Gerber's testimony that the outline on Marilyn's blood-spattered pillow had been caused by a surgical instrument. He got him to agree that he had searched all over the United States for such an instrument and hadn't found one in 12 years. Throughout the trial, the jury was carefully sequestered. They were impressed with the medical witnesses produced by the defense. These included a dentist who testified that two of Sam's teeth had been broken by a genuine assailant on the beach, and it was impossible for him to have inflicted such damage on himself. Likewise, a doctor testified that he had examined Dr. Sam two days after the crime and found that one of his vertebrae was fractured and his spinal cord was bruised. Could he have somehow inflicted such damage on himself? Asked F. Lee Bailey. The doctor replied, only if he had dived out of a second story window. In his hour-long summing up for the defense, 
F. Lee Bailey re-emphasized all these inconsistencies and described the prosecution's evidence as 10 pounds of hogwash in a five pound bag. On the 16th of November at 10.45 in the morning, the jury was brought back from its hotel to begin its deliberations. As the press crowded round the courtroom entrance, F. Lee Bailey was allowed to take his client back to the hotel where they were staying during the trial, and they prepared for a long press siege. His problem now was to keep Dr. Sam off the bottle. For the sad truth was that Sam Shepard was a sick man. The years of stress and the physical ordeal of prison had changed the athletic young doctor into a shell of a man. During his second trial, he was drinking heavily and relying on drugs to get him through the day. Although the press was writing about the fairy tale marriage of the twice tried doctor, he and his glamorous bride were no longer a happy couple. Ariane resented the gag put on her by her husband's lawyer, who was afraid that she would alienate the media. Suddenly, at 10.20 p.m. that night, the verdict came through. 12 years late, Dr. Samuel H. Shepard was exonerated. The celebrations were muted as the verdict left open one crucial question. Who really did murder Marilyn Shepard? This remains unanswered to this day. Later, F. Lee Bailey was reflective. At some time when this thing began to boil over back in 1954, should have taken the other side. If, if one powerful organ of the news media is beginning to go overboard and using its tremendous strength to persecute, persecute one man, then there should be another equally powerful organ somewhere to step in and contest. And uh, I have studied all the clippings. I never saw anybody come out for Sam Shepard. It isn't the reporting ability of the news media that's frightening, it's the editing ability. Just as a newspaper had the power to put in the good evidence for the state as to a witness and leave out the bad evidence, they had the power to write editorials back in 1954 and to spur the people to action, and they should have this power. It's important, but it can easily be abused. I think it was then. And I think that's why this case happened. Sam Shepard was acquitted tonight, and it's a moment of triumph, I suppose, but it's dampened by the fact that it comes 12 years too late. Dr. Sam wrote a book about his ordeal, and he and Ariane went on a tour to publicize it. But behind the public facade, their relationship was doomed, and two years after the second trial, she returned to Germany and sued for divorce. He got his license to practice medicine back, but was forced out of his profession after one operation resulted in a medical malpractice suit. He resigned from the hospital, couldn't get another medical job, and finally descended to becoming a professional wrestler. It was a sport he had loved at college. In October 1969, he married his manager's 19-year-old daughter, but died weeks later of a liver ailment. But despite the tragic wrecking of his life, Shortly before he died, Sam Shepard showed before a Senate committee that he recognized that some good had come out of his 16-year ordeal. The wheels of justice grind slowly, but in this country, it took 10 years to vindicate me. And I hope by testifying here that I can justify the fact that the Supreme Court of the United States and the people of the United States have made a wrong right. They can't give me back my parents and other things, but they have attempted, and this is what this free country is all about. I'm proud of my country. I want to make it better in the future, which is what you people are doing. And I hope to justify the fact that a guy who was wrongfully convicted was finally released. <laughs>